been making our fifth studio album since we started our first album, it feels like, you know, it's been an, an inevitable sort of course and trajectory, but when it was going to be finished was probably sort of uh, the issue that no one could, or the question no one could answer. Um, we've probably had various versions of this album almost finished in the last sort of four years, um, and amidst sort of other projects, distractions, it's kind of nearly materialised, and it hasn't, you know. Um, I think we knew it was reaching a point where it was feeling like an album, maybe this sort of like April or May or something, you know, or maybe March, when the, the collection of tracks started to feel like they, they felt like a good album or sort of something you'd want to sort of like deliver, you know. I think the internet offers you a, a cheeky interface with people as well, where you can sort of make announcements that possibly you might sort of be a little bit more tight-lipped about if you were speaking to someone uh, in the pub or someone from the press, where you might say, "Yeah, we're gonna, we're, yeah, let's put, we're, we're feeling it. We're on a roll. Let's put a new album out. We reckon a new album might be out at the end of this year." And it might be a bold statement you make in all seriousness, but the reality of it is, you know, it's it's likely not to happen with us. You know, I mean, we will constantly announce things that aren't going to happen. You know, and our career has been littered with uh, strange strategies and bad timing. You know. It's called lying, mate. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a politician's answer. I don't know, it's strange. We've had various, you know, versions of what might be described as this album and even tracks which share the same folders as their previous incarnations just solely because we've kept the name, even though the tracks probably changed beyond recognition, uh, musically, vocally or whatever, you know. Um, but it has a common sort of, like, legacy, you know. And I think that it gets to a point on every album where you feel that there's a sort of, like, an energy that's brewing and you, and you sort of start to sort of go with the momentum of that energy. And I think when we went to Damon, Damon Auburn's studio in November and then went to see Tim Goldsworthy in New York and the work we'd done in those two periods combined with getting our sort of shit together in Bristol, it started to feel like actually this is an album. When Martina came down to Bristol, which was something we'd been planning for a long time, but we finally got it together. I think all those combinations of people and energy, they sort of, sort of, just sort of create something which felt like it was, it was real, you know. It's been a case of uh, maybe initiating tracks in taking a track through to fruition and, you know, if and when we need each other's uh, input, then we'll ask, whether it be for a vocal or, you know, even just for an opinion. Um, so, you know, the way that we made the album was the fact that we've, you know, started it, you know, in November and stuff, and we've, we've worked together, but like I say, it was a case that, you know, we were actually in the same studio working, so there was a spiritual awareness of what was going on, but not necessarily a sort of physical awareness because, like I said, you know, tracks were started and initiated and maybe finished by, you know, each one of us. But, the, you know, the actual atmosphere is, you know, it's, it's great at the moment, you know. We've had our ups and downs, but, you know, you know it, was an, it, was a, it was an amicable, um, I think, you know, we you work know in, procedure, really, wasn't it? We work in different ways, you don't, you know, I mean, historically, you know, going back to sort of, you know, go back to, I guess, Blue Lines being a different thing altogether because it was our first record, you know, and that was probably our most, the record where we were all in each other's faces in the studio in Cameron McVeigh's house, all on top of each other, with uh, Johnny Dollar, you know, sadly who passed away this year, you know, who kind of got, helped us to sort of like uh, coexist and coordinate, you know what I mean, with, with each other, you know, in a very new manner, because it was really a speculative demo, that album. But from that period onwards, you know, I think we found our own paths, you know. Um, I think historically, you know, G is, has a more of a DJ orientated attitude to things, you know, and, and is sometimes quite aloof from that in that sense because he's not going to be in the studio hour by hour, minute by minute, the same way I might be or Mush was or Neil, Neil's been with me, you know what I mean, where we sort of will sit there for, you know, weeks on end, but G will come in with ideas and leave, leave again, he'll offer an opinion and vice versa and, and in the sense we'll offer the same tracks he's, he's brought to us, you know, and, and help to sort of like those tracks to evolve. But I, I think the interesting thing about this record that as opposed to the last two in particular, there's not been a central conflict which has maybe defined the relationships in the studio or the nature of the album and its, its kind of, its mood. It's, I think it's more upbeat, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, I love to say the word because we've been using it a lot in the last couple of weeks, but it's more communal, you know, there's 
more people involved, more personalities, that brings a different energy to the studio or to the various studios we've worked in on this record, you know. I think the change of location from Bristol, New York, London has, has given it a different feel as well. 100th Window was very much a, a Bristol album, you know, and it was in one studio and people came to it, Sinead, Horace, you know, it's a different experience. Each track has uh, historically been a moment, you, you know, we, you don't sort of sit down with a set of backing tracks and strategize an album and work out how you're going to finish it. It is one track at a time and, and how you work on that track is dependent on who you're collaborating with or what you're feeling for it is. It might be shelved for a year, picked back up again, it might be deconstructed and rebuilt. There's never really a central strategy. I think that comes into play in the production side of it, when you're about to finish it, when you feel there's a record, what approach you take, you know, in the sense that 100th Window was a strong reaction to anti-mezzanine because to me that record was still about loops and big bass lines and heavy beats and 100th Window was about intricacies and layers and, and, and very much was, I, I guess, the, probably the most Pro Tools record we made which was governed by the machinery and the computers um, in terms of everything being crafted in that world. And this record in terms of its production, the sound was more of getting away from that, simplifying everything, stripping it back, making the instruments very evident. So when we were doing drums, if they were drums recorded in New York, they were very dry, very small drum booth, very simple. If they're electronic, they're very electronic. And the contrast between the tracks and the, and the moments within the tracks being made to be very evident, you know. 100th Window was about a lot of crafting and lots of layers which were, you know, possibly inter interlacing and you weren't sure what was what. The idea of this record was to make it very apparent and very immediate what was what. So whether it was an analog or an electronic keyboard, you'd recognise those sounds and the differences like, between them. When a track sounds to us a little bit like it's something we've done before, you will fight against it and, and try to drag it somewhere else. And a lot of tracks, because they don't, you know, don't won't survive that process, will will disappear or, or be left behind, you know. But we you know, I think in the in the basic sort of curiosity of making a record, you don't want to do what you've done before. You know, you want to take it somewhere different because that's the only way you feel confident about what you're doing. You know, for us, we've always been a clash of ideas, and it, as well as that creating conflict in the band historically, it's been what makes it interesting. The difference between, you know, I guess blue lines and mezzanine are quite extreme, but they make it interesting. You know, the, the whole point of getting to those places is 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 part of the is part of the whole process. You know, and if it does mean fighting because different personalities have different musical preferences historically or personally, then you're going to have fights. You know, but that's part of what the band's always been about, really. I think because a lot of the work on this record was when we got to November and we went to Damon's studio. We had a, a very sort of like a joint opinion about what we wanted to do, how we wanted to finish it, not necessarily how it was going to sound and all the, all the moments and all the tracks, but that we wanted to get this record finished and we wanted to enjoy the process. You know, going to Damon's studio was about as much a change of scene and energy as it was to try and make some good music. And again, going to see Tim uh, Goldsworthy in New York, again, a different energy, a different way of looking at the drums we were working with. Martina brought uh, a, a new energy to the studio too, which was really, you know, really nice. And I guess especially after knowing her for so long, you know, in a, in a different way, working with her, which could have been sometimes, you know, working with friends or, or colleagues can be a disaster, you know. And this, luckily, this was really good, you know, really good fun. The record was about a lot of different personalities and it seems nice to sort of represent the title of the album in a, in, as a place as opposed to just a thing or a phrase or a word or it, it felt more a kind of a, it felt more accurate to represent to sort of describe a place where everyone might coexist or not or you know that, that, that was more interesting I think than just a very cool sort of phrase you could sort of dig out you know. To be honest the history of the island was something that was became more apparent later after sort of sort of really getting into the idea of the word or falling in love with the, the word, um, which in itself sounds like an anagram of lots of other words, which is why it's, it's such a nice word. But the history of the place is, you know, absolutely intriguing. And also the fact that one of the earliest spellings, Helgoland, also means Holy Land, which is, which is obviously very kind of, uh, you know, poetic and, and um, you know, I think the history, the, the quantum physics thing, the British military uh, occupation of the island, the 
the detonating of that bomb, the Big Bang, the biggest subnuclear explosion, all those different parts of its history, its 60s utopian paradise concept. Um, it's, yeah, it's got loads of, you know, it's got, it's got too much history, really. I think there's, there's always difficult tracks. I think Atlas Air was one of those epically difficult tracks that had def five different versions of it historically in, 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 its, in its shadow for some reason just could never get finished and it ended up being a completely different musical track, different rhythm track, different chord structure, different lyrics, different vocal performance. It was just, every time I mentioned it, it was called Marrakesh to the guys. I just get this like collective groan, you know what I mean? From Gio, anyone, you know, it's never going to get finished type of attitude. Finally, it got nailed on the deadline, you know. Um, but on the whole, I've, I think a lot of the tracks were about exploring the sort of the opportunities and the possibilities within them. So, I mean, the Tunney track was mm. like a completely different song originally, yeah. wasn't it? When we took it to New York, you know, and then it stayed on the shelf for like two years before we went back to New York and Tunney redid a vocal which was completely different than the original vocal, which then kind of informed how we finished the track, arranged it, rearranged it, cut it up, changed the, the middle section. Um, and that track, I suppose, that and Paradise Circus, Saturday Comes Slow, are tracks which uh, possibly from the last couple of years as opposed to new instant tracks which which we which I guess you could add to things like Splitting the Atom and uh, Martina tracks uh, yeah Psyche, Psyche and Babel and stuff yeah. which are much more you know happen a lot quicker um, I think with Flat of the Blade for instance you know taking that to Damon's studio and, and messing around with the bass line completely changed the way we thought of the track initially and in fact when Guy came to the studio him sort of like you know sort of like heading towards this track which really was just a ricochets of drums and no music whatsoever and starting this kind of vocal mantra almost kind of like white blues gospel thing which was really bizarre you know I mean when you know with Guy you, you may be the, the, an outside sort of like perspective expecting to sort of work on something very beautiful and soulful more more what you'd expect from Elbow but it was a completely different approach he took which made it really intriguing you know and I think everyone who came in seem to point to a different track than you'd expect them to and often we try and get people to sort of orienteer people towards different things so then we're not doing the obvious thing we, you know you might expect from that person whether it's been Tracy Thorne in the past or a little Elizabeth you try something that hasn't been done before by either them or us and in this record I think people did that automatically they headed towards these tracks almost magnetically which is quite strange Going to Damon's studio was a, a, a decision which kind of helped also placate the, the people who we just informed that we were going to basically shelve the album we had at the end of last year, to, which was met, that sort of like idea was met with, as you can imagine, a total deafening silence, which went on for a couple of weeks. And then it was followed by a big round of applause, and we said, yeah, but we're going to Damon's studio. And once we coerced... We're talking about the... The record company, yeah? yeah. <laughs> and the management, yeah. <laughs> and everyone around us who couldn't understand why we were shelving an album which they'd heard live that they seemed to be enjoying all the summer previously from Meltdown onwards when we curated Meltdown. Um, but Damon agreed to work with us after sort of saying that he wouldn't get sucked into a two-year Bristolian vortex and would only do it over a period of two weeks from the hours of 10 a.m. till 6 p.m. and everything would be in a major key, no minor keys whatsoever. Of course, all that changed when we got there apart from the Vortex bit. No, it was, it was, it was a great impetus, actually, because, you know, like Dee was saying, you know, we came back and we had a, what we thought was al the album and we kind of shelved it and, uh, you know, we were a bit at a loss as to where to begin to, you know, where, where, where the starting point was going to be to, you know, start off Heligoland and, uh, you know, we, we decided, um, or we asked Damon if we'd come to his studio and he agreed and uh, it, it was a great, it was a great starting point you know, a great springboard to, to work from, you know. Working with Damon, you know, he's a complete genius. And, uh, you know, once we'd started those sessions with Damon, it, it was no looking back, really. You know, it, was, it became so fruitful that, you know, it seemed if we had slowed down the process of work or the work rate, then uh, it would have been a fruitless um, exercise. And also we had uh, Damon in the, back, in the background saying, uh, when are my tracks going to be finished then? <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of a bit of a carry-on, really. So we, we went to New York and uh, to Williamsburg to work with uh, Tundi and uh, Tim Goldsworthy and uh, also did some recording here, right here in the studio now in Bristol.
I think with Tundi, he sort of like he he kind of knows when he's doing his vocal how many different takes he wants to uh, attempt, and he knows how many different types of vocal he wants to attempt, and he kind of as he when he starts, he, he starts to build up layers and layers, and he knows he wants to do another layer, in it and he'll move away from the mic and do something a little bit more coarse, then back to the mic something more soft, and you can tell in his head. He's creating a collage himself, you know, and you add that to the fact that we're looking at an arrangement on the whole thinking, right, this is going to work by moving this around, this whole part of the track, and you're trying to sort of build it in your mind as he's putting a vocal in. But it's really great to be, be around him doing that because it's someone who, some vocalists need a lot of instruction, you know, they kind of need to be guided. Cindy just kind of gets in there and, and has a million ideas, you know, and it's really great to sort of to sit back and, and, and listen to it unfold, you know. We've always been fascinated by, you know, and uh, I think from the moment she, you know, Tricky played her, you know, when Tricky played me the first demo that he'd done with Martina, and me and Tricky were still living together, I still remember him putting a cassette into the machine and me being, you know, totally overwhelmed with jealousy and not being able to accept the fact that he'd found her in Bristol, you know, just around the corner, and I couldn't understand that, and it was just impossible to sort of deal with. And, you know, she ended up making a great album with him and, and then on, going on to making more amazing music herself and collaborating with some great people um, and we've sort of you know we've been in similar orbits for a long time at gigs festivals and she's done shows with us and it was inevitable we'd eventually get her into the studio but there's always that kind of fear in the background that you want something so much that it might go wrong that you know maybe the chemistry wouldn't be right but it, you know, it was lovely Fortunately that's, that's the only track that was done by um, <laughs> The powers of uh, electronics, you know, we kind of sent the tracks. <clears throat> Initially had a couple of tracks for um, Hope that we wanted her to do. Sent them, sent them to Hope and uh, she sent them back and that's how it was done really, back and forth. Unfortunately we haven't met her but, you know, we're hoping to, um, you know, have her come with us on tour for a couple of gigs in, in the States. But, um, you know, I was, we, I was aware, made aware of her by the guys that I was working with actually uh, at the time for the demo, so uh, guys called the robots, and uh, you know, I, I, I think, actually don't know where I'd, I'd probably been asleep for all these years because I hadn't been aware of Hope, to be honest, until then, which was like a couple of years ago. And um, yeah, she has the most amazing, you know, angst, you know, sort of emotional voice. And uh, what more can you say about her? But she's just amazing. so simple it, it was unbelievable you know thinking that you know you'd have this really complicated set of backward and forth it, it was really literally we've actually got two tracks from hope you know which uh, she did and absolutely amazing when, when we got it back it was like sort of on, hit it on the nail straight away but Horace is like you know for instance an amazing character he's re really is he, he for us I guess you know he was it was always like a, a total dream to work with someone like Horace and, and being in his company for so, such a long time now, you know, 20 years, I guess, almost, it's mad, you know, because, you know, 18 years, I suppose, to be accurate, but he's, you know, it's just amazing being around him. You kind of get the sensation, you know, get that you get to understand... What he's I guess, saying. Yeah, you understand, <laughs> finally understand what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> They're all surprised with Horace and the fact that, you know, Horace is, you know, from that traditional reggae background, and you know, this is my this is my strong point here, isn't it? You know, uh, you know, that traditional reggae background, and the fact that he's really open-minded, you know. And uh, I said before, it's kind of funny, really, because we work with him, and uh, you know, when he goes back to Jamaica, he must really have the piss taken out of him, really, for working with uh, with us, because uh, I don't think anyone in Jamaica understands our music at all, and they can't understand for the life of me what Horace is doing with us, you know. <laughs> I mean, the artwork is something that um, has been a, a, around us from the beginning when we were the Wild Bunch, you know, doing the, you know, taking a space and, you know, getting into a warehouse and painting graffiti and drawing the flyers on that very sort of old school level was the fun of, of being in what, about what we were doing, you know. It's been with us all the way and I think after, maybe after protection, I got a little bit bored of doing paintings and wanted to work more photographically and had the chance to work with Tom Hingston and Nick Knight and we got 
threw ourselves right into a strange world of combinations of images on mezzanine, collages of images, and then 100th Window took it to a more extreme level with blowing up the glass figures and then re, you know, sort of rebuilding them as composites. Um, and again on Collected, it was again a very photographic, graphic image. James Lavelle got me back into painting again on, on War Stories when I did the sleeve for him. And I hadn't painted the sleeve in that intense way for quite a while, so it was a little bit of a shock to the system. And I had a deadline to work to, which was good. And I kind of gave myself a little bit of a deadline on this record to try and do some paintings which would give, give a sense of space and belonging for the record, you know, something that you understood in us historically and something which made sense of now of what the record's about, what it sounds like, who's involved in it. I, you know, I don't know if it's always successful. I mean, on the on the kind of like one of the, the my favourite format is the one with the book, where you put a book full of images, which is really exciting because you get a chance to work like you would as. I mean, if you know, it's the difference between a film and a, and a box set of The Wire or The Sopranos, where you can work over a, a long form period as opposed to trying to tell a story in 90 minutes. And you know, with the book, you get lots of pages of things, which give you an image of the band in a much more full way, as opposed to the old CD jewel case, which is, you know, cut and run. And digitally, I think with the website, it, gives, it offers the opportunity to present the artwork in so many different ways over a long period of time. And I think with the website now, the ability to put on downloads and tracks and stream things, put up our photographs from the tour, it's much more of, a, of an evolving sort of space as opposed to a, a finite sort of point of sale or some really dull space where you find out the tour dates. It's kind of an evolutionary thing, which I think for the first time we've almost got right. I'm, ho I'm kind of only hope that other people agree with that, you know. We're lucky, you know, we're lucky to have travelled, we're lucky to have had the ability and the chance to communicate and transmit what we do and share that experience with various people in different towns and countries around the world. And we've got, a, you know, very inexplicable but great relationship with certain cities, you know. I mean, Lisbon, Paris, Glasgow, Dublin, for instance, are just great sort of places where we feel a real connection, but that isn't to belittle or, or sort of like, you know, minimise the relationship we have with any other sort of, of the great places we've had a chance to, to tour in, you know. And I think we've toured probably maybe six of the last ten years. So it's been a very, an energy field for us which we draw on, you know, uh, you know a lot. And um, that kind of form of communication is so different from in the studio. In the studio, you're aware that you're creating something for the future. And when you're obviously on stage, you're actually ha it's happening now. In fact, in one of the things about the album, in terms of its sound and production, was to try and get the sensation that the music was being made as you listen to it, as opposed to something that was prepared earlier. And I think in the production we almost managed to capture some of that. In some of the tracks it feels almost like you're listening in on the, on the session, you know, because it's so kind of raw. Um, I don't know really, but I think it's more of a case of that uh, starvation of certain cultures, you know, whereas in England, you know, they're kind of... Uh, we've been bombarded with uh, different genres of music and stuff like that, so we've been quite sport, really, in a way, and uh, usually it's a case of, well, impress us, whereas you, you go abroad and that whole thing, it translates a lot better internationally. You know, we're quite shocked sometimes at going to France and Germany and, and, and you know, other European countries and uh, realising that we're actually a lot bigger there than we're... and the response that we get is a lot greater there than we do when we get to, when we're in England. You know, it's more of a case that, uh, you know, especially if you come to Bristol sometimes, you know, it's, <laughs> you get absolutely zi uh, nil point, as you might <laughs> say, you know. <laughs> so it's kind of harder, you know, to, uh, to actually impress the, the indigenous crowd than it is to, you know, a, a more of a, you know, the foreign crowd as such. And I, I kind of find that quite weird, and it's the same with the media, really, in a way. You know, the English media love to... Uh, bring their own down, don't they? And it's that sort of same sort of attitude, really, in a way, you know, slightly uh, complacent about the way they feel about you. Go to Europe, they're, they're more warming and, you know, more inviting. Of course, I mean, the thing about our, our sort of history in our band is the, the multiculturalism of what of Britain and that and the era we grew up in, you know, um, is, is what defined us, you know, my Italian roots, G's Barbadian roots, the, the sort of like the Afro-Caribbean roots of Bristol, the reggae history of Bristol, what made Massive Attack, what made the Wild Bunch. That was really ultra important, the whole 
the punk, ska, reggae scene than the hip-hop scene and how that sort of was the way people interfaced with the past and the future. That was really what we were about, you know. And it's great going back to, you know, when I've been to Jamaica and Barbados to see where this comes from as much as I think G enjoys coming to Italy and, and Naples in particular seeing the history of my, of my sort of ancestry because it's really intriguing and amazing to see how that it manifests now and, and, the, and the city for me obviously has uh, an amazing allure you know my, it's, it's my obviously my father's town and I've got a lot of family history there and I, as a place I find it absolutely fascinating as well being in the shadow of Vesuvius and the attitude there the passion there the chaos there um, when, when Gamora was offered as a, as a project so of course I was like super keen to take it and it was a free mutual friend and um, it was it was a great project to be working with you know you know the fact that we do sort of actually sharing and celebrating each other's you know backgrounds and you know, I you know I love going to Italy and any chance that I get I'll go there and it almost feels like a, a second home to me you know from the fact that you know Dee's initiated, initiated me into the family the food and the food <laughs> and um, you know likewise Dee's saying you know he loves coming to the West Indies and you know celebrating that so it's you know it's always been a real great cross-pollination of you know cultures really and some cultures luckily in this like you said in this day and age have remained um, quite intact I think Italy is very Italian Jamaica is very Jamaican and, and like living with Horace Andy on the tour you're surrounded by the Jamaican thing constantly you know because <laughs> he's on the phone to Jamaica every <laughs> three minutes you know and, and and he's always bringing his is like his Food. salt fish onto the bus which like then you can imagine as it goes through the air conditioning system you'll get a taste of it in your bunk if it did it was probably interesting because it was that I didn't want to use the same any of the same processes involved in film score work on this record I think I was getting very slightly despondent with the, the work on film for you know more in, in the last year because I find it slightly unrewarding you know because it tends to sort of end up becoming generic no matter how you start I think there's a fear of silence in movies you know that, that directors producers distributors cannot take and every film has to ha have the same device to tell to sort of help the plot evolve or to help the audience interface with the characters to give them permission to laugh and cry etc all that sort of crap and after a while it really does become a bore and um, I think working in Pro Tools a lot of the time on film stuff, you tend to be doing lots of tones and layering. And again, on this record, it was about stripping away all that, keeping it very sharp, very, very sort of like Spartan almost in places, lots of space, which was really, really this, one of the intentions of the sound of this record. And I think, you know, ironically, Gamora was probably my ha happiest, most favourite moment in, in recent years on film scoring. And that's a film with no music in it at all, which goes to say a lot about the process. And when Matteo Garoni came to Bristol and, and I saw the film, I was like, you need music in this because it is so intense and beautiful that you're, you're thrown straight into it, that it would destroy that moment if you were to put music between you and the film. And, you know, we tried a few things and it didn't work and eventually we agreed on, on, on the naturalistic way that film is and sound design and did, did something for the end, you know. The industry has changed and it's... I probably I mean to be to give you a sort of a roundabout answer, you know, a long form answer. We're in a sort of space I think we feel pretty comfortable with in terms of how the industry is now, in where from where we were coming from, from the DJ perspective of taking music and sampling music and playlisting music. This is the way people, you know, sort of accept music now and share it. We certainly get that and it's really that whole peer to peer thing is something which we've been around from our very beginning. We really kind of dig that. And in in the sense that everything is, is sort of everything's presented in a totally different way. It doesn't have to go through, you know, sort of like the conformed channels that you used to have to go through. You have to create, a, make a video for hundred grand. It had to get onto MTV. It had to be sort of like a had to have a marquee sort of presentation night. It, now it's you can you can put films together and you can you can uh, transmit them in so many different ways. And, and obviously for us, even going on tour last year, YouTube um, meant that all our songs that were possibly going to be on the album we shelved were actually all out there in the world anyway, with videos, in a way. So you think, what's the point in making a pop video now? Because people make their own videos. If I go and watch a bit, if I want to get the football highlights, someone's already edited, edited it together and added music and put their own title sequence up nowadays, you know? And 
we want to give the directors we work with a, a kind of a, a different sort of a, a different space for it. So look, if we give you a small budget as opposed to a big budget, and you make the film you want to the track you choose, and you can pull the track apart. We'll give you the stems. You can do what you want. It's a, it's it's more. It's, I think it's just more interesting now. You know, we've done the other thing, and this is the way it was always heading. And I think it's got there at last. You know, to a certain degree. Um, so the films we got are the director's personal visions done on a very tight budget in a very lo-fi and intriguing way, you know, possibly never to be seen outside of the, the internet, you know. It's, it's, it's interesting because I think when we both watched it, we found it very difficult to watch. And when Bailey Walsh had su suggested the, the idea of filming a bullfight, it was obviously an issue which was difficult and, and troubling. Um, because we don't really agree with that sort of that, that torture or that sort of cruelty, so watching it was hard work, and it was a very far from enjoyable, enjoyable experience. But we were suddenly in the same place as everyone else who watched it, and removed from the song, and we're getting the same impression and the same emotional response from it that everyone else would. And it was quite strange that because obviously working with Bailey Walsh in the past and being in the edit suite at the end of Daydreaming and Unfinished Sympathy, which obviously didn't have any edits. But that thing where it's your track and you're going to present it together, suddenly it was Bailey's film with our music in the background, and it was very disturbing, but something very beautiful about the filmmaking. So it was a very complicated bit of work, which we really kind of appreciated. Of course, if, if someone was offended by the bullfighting video, we say we're, we're offended by it too, which is the whole point of the video. The bullfighting video is hard to watch. It's very difficult to stomach. And it's very uncomfortable, and it's something that's very, but it's also something that's happening in a very real way. What we're doing is not glamorising it; we're drawing attention to it. Yes, the study on erotography, for instance. Again, the director's idea, which was, you know, massively intriguing, and I think it's a brilliant piece of filmmaking, a brilliant piece of work, you know. Um, and what's surprising about it is, is, is the kind of what you get, what, you, what it leaves you with, and I think that statement that the actress makes about the fact that she'd do anything to be on camera, that was back three, over three decades ago, in this, in this, framed in this environment culturally, is amazing, the fact that that's what we're surrounded by, people would do anything to be on camera, anything to be on TV, and that was what was shaping her decisions back then, and no matter how degrading or stimulating it was, that was the reason for being there, and I think that was very, a very, the most poignant part of it for me. Historically, we've we've been lucky to work with the people we have, and from Bailey Walsh onwards, so we, we shared a you know we, our initial conversations about film and our cinematic references were what kind of shaped the way we work with him. You know, um, this time around, it's very different with all directors because we're giving over the music entirely and saying you do what you want, and we're quite prepared to sort of like um, relinquish all creative control and say that you know, you, like I said, you can have the stems, you can pull it apart and re-edit it treat it as if we are the soundtrack to your film as opposed to you making us a promo. Because I think it's, we've done all that, you know, and I think it's, it's more interesting this way around. So a lot of the issues that are going to be dealt with on the films aren't about the music necessarily or about us. They're issues to be discussed in a, in a, in a wider sort of range, in a greater arena, which I think is what it's about with us, you know, putting things out there which uh, present discussion, you know, the same way as, the, as we talked about the the screen and the visuals are about creating discussion and when people come to us after the gigs they get different things out of the show and they, they want to talk about different areas of the, the content on the screen whether it's the economic issues, the political issues, the geographic issues you know and we get lots of different discussion generated by that and I think that's great rather than oh we really love your gig or we love your album which is obviously a little bit banal we're in a, in a space where we're communicating on a different level which is I think more, it's more what we're about you know Yeah, there's still a great excitement, and you know the fact that you know <clears throat> we're, uh, we're we're in a we're in a position where we, you know it, it kind of feels good to be doing this, you know, and, and the fact that we've got it's a great to have an interface with the crowd after being in the studio for such you know uh, such a long time, and you know it's quite an intense period being in the studio and uh, sometimes getting out <coughs> myself in D, you know, me and D. It's good that we you know we can hang out for a little bit. With the visual uh, as a very sort of like a, a bit of a, it's not, you know, but that's saying it's a journey or it's cinematic and all those kind of cliched sort of phrases, but you kind of, we tend to sort of try and make it a little difficult at the beginning, you know, to challenge challenge everyone's kind of, you know, sort of notions of what we're about or just to sort of like draw people in in a different way, you know. 
as opposed to going in with what you know and then working backwards. I think it's more interesting to sort of, I mean, sometimes we've done what, you know, I think a few other bands have done where you go, you put a couple of big hits right at the front to get them out of the way because you're kind of slightly annoyed about that and then you sort of make it difficult. But on the whole, you try and make it a bit more intriguing and draw people in. I mean, that was the first time that the, the screen had a, a direct, um, you know, well, it's hard to describe it as how the first time the whole thing went full circle, wasn't yes, it? Yeah. It was a complete, a complete information sort of like loop, which was, you know, normally we'd sort of go to a, a place and we'd take random information, you know, some political, some trivia, and we'd make a, I guess, a collage of it and, and it'd transmit on the screen. And just to kind of illustrate the contradictions in, in everyday, you know, news, media, life, information, and the whole show's a lot of that in our show, a lot of visual um, stimulation or stimulus and, you know, I guess sort of like uh, chucking words with the music which give everything a different meaning. Um, in this particular case, that information about a guy called Stefano Cucchi who died in prison and one of many Italian men, young men, in the last 10 years, I think there's something like 1,500, almost 1,500 men, young men a year commit suicide or die in police custody or prison. Um, which is a you know a crazy and terrible sort of like statistic for a, you know a civilized sort of country. Excuse this me. was the latest in a in a quite a long uh, story, really. You know what I mean? And we put it up on the screen because some uh, we have, we often get students in, in in the gig to translate and the headlines or the local and, and international and choose the things that are kind of the most intriguing or the most trivial. You know. And this, this, this information went up. It was from the La, La Repubblica paper saying there needs to be justice for Stefano Kuki. You know, we need to know the truth. And someone had filmed it in the crowd, you know, put it onto YouTube. The La Repubblica picked it back up from YouTube. They transmitted it on La Repubblica online and it got picked up by the national news agencies. Um, at the end of the two, three days of, of, of activity, the justice minister had commented to the press and said we will look into Stefano Kuki's case, whether that was a direct result, who knows, you know. But it was amazing to see this loop of information, how it travelled, how where we'd taken it from and where it ended up. And I think it kind of <coughs> makes, I suppose, that us doesn't validate what we do on the screen, but it, it it makes it shows how important it is to kind of to sort of I, I suppose communicate with the audience in that way. So it's not just turning up here we are to turn up and do a gig, this is our latest album, we're promoting something. It's much more of a sharing, sharing of information, a sharing of the space you're all in on that day, you know. But well, that's the interesting thing, isn't it? You, you, like I said, you've got so much information available to, to everybody, yet you've got a situation happening which is barbaric and unjust, and nothing's, happened, nothing's been done about it. So you would, you'd assume that because the information was so accessible that this couldn't happen anymore. That, you know, in the past, where you, you could cover up anything, and anything can happen anywhere, and no one would know about it now. In the, in the digital age with CCTV cameras everywhere and the internet, you'd imagine that nothing could, could happen without everyone else knowing, but it's almost so much information Sorry. now that people just don't see beyond it because you know it's so transparent, you see right through it altogether that you don't even stop in the middle and, and, and check it. You go right through to the other side. I, th I think historically we've, because maybe also because of our travel, you know, we've been in, we've sort of uh, been confronted with situations, groups of people that have have kind of uh, engaged in us in their in their sort of like issues, you know. Um, and I think, I sp particularly after you know, I think the the, the amount of effort and head space that went into the kind of the mobilisation of a protest against the Iraq invasion, realising really that how little effect it would have on a, on a great scale. But it was really a sort of a vote of no from the people, but end result being that you didn't really connect with anything or anyone. When you work with small organisations like the Hoping Foundation or last year with Reprieve or someone like Clive Stafford Smith who deals with, uh, you know, those without sort of representation, Guantanamo, Death Row, you know you can connect on a real level and they, that they are a, a real organisation that goes straight to the heart of the matter and, you, and if you can um, sort of like contribute something then it's real. Um, but the Hoping Foundation is a very similar thing. I mean we've been to Israel and, and Palest the Palestinian territories in, is in, in, in around Israel and we've seen you know firsthand how, what a crazy place it is you know and I think you know when we had a chance to sort of like help engage with the Palestinian cause it was really important because it's 
very misrepresented or unrepresented outside of its own region. Um, and you know, for us, I mean, we, we almost tried to put gigs on in Palestine. It was almost it's been impossible to try and arrange that. But in the end of it, you think, well, our massive attack music doesn't mean anything to Palestinian kids. You know, they got so much going on in their lives, or so much there's not so much stuff that's not going on in their lives because they've been isolated economically, politically. Um, that it'd be better to try and do something to help them make music, to put some money back into the refugee camps on a community level. We're going to try and help build some studios in the various refugee camps over the next couple of years, raise more money for the, for the, the charity, the organisation itself, so the Palestinian kids can make their own music and then basically explain and, and, co and communicate their situation as opposed to us kind of trying to impose our musical artistic ideas on them, which I think is a much more real way of doing it. We've done some great things in the past as far as we were concerned. The, the gig with Porter's Head for the Tsunami Aid, the, the work with Gorillaz for the yeah, Red Cross in Afghanistan in the past. But you do get the sense that you don't know what's happening, you know, it, it sort of tends to disappear. I mean, I've been lucky enough to work with the Gorilla organisation in, in Uganda and the Congo and Rwanda. And it's amazing to see that you can put some money to build a ranger, a ranger station and something real happens there. And, and the, the sort of like the it's actually a, a real connection to what is really happening on the ground, you know, but sometimes we've done things in the past where you wonder really where it all goes, you know, you come out of it feeling strangely um, unsatisfied. We're doing four shows in February um, for the Hoping Foundation in uh, Newport, Brighton, London and then Paris. In the Paris one we're hoping to collaborate with JR on as well, um, which, you know, which again I hope we can try and sort of um, uh, raise some money and, and engage with the issues of uh, the Palestinian youth and, uh, and, and sort of maybe shine a, a bit of light there because since the, the, the war in Gaza or the bombardment of Gaza last year, this year in fact, there's been very little um, media attention on the region. It's just sort of coagulated again and, and congealed and, you know, we still don't know what's happening. There's been sort of like a, a kind of slightly flaccid push from the Obama administration to engage in the process, but so far not a lot, as far as I can see, has been achieved. Um, so even tiny little uh, moments like this can hopefully affect someone's life, you know. There's a person who's we just kind of become aware of through, um, you know, our kind of natural interest in the graffiti art you know, evolution really, obviously being a graffiti artist in the past and Massive Attack and the Wild Bunch before it being about that world. Um, we've, you know, we've always been fascinated in that, in that side of the art scene. JR is, is, a, is, a, is a brilliant, you know, recent, more recent artist. Um, he's probably the, the first artist I've ever sort of known who actually doesn't go out and paint his own name on the wall primarily, including me and actually sort of pace up images of other people. So it's more about the people in the space or people from another space transplanting onto a different space as opposed to him saying, I was there, I was here. You know, and I think that's really, really amazing, really, you know, um, especially in this day and age, in this world where it's very sort of like the selfish gene orientated and he's very different than that. And it's great to work with him in Paris. He, I think he's got a, like a lot of, luckily for us, we've got a really good connection with the French and the Parisian audience. And so JR was aware of us, you know, and what we're, and what we're about and our history. So it was a very kind of, um, you know, organic collaboration, if you will.